I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 40 with me this morning. Psalm chapter 40 this morning. We're just going to be looking at verses 1 through 6 this morning, and then we'll be in this uh, chapter for the next few weeks. Psalm chapter 40. I'd like to read just verses 1 through 6 uh, this morning for us. Psalm chapter 40, beginning in verse 1. It says, For the choir director, a Davidic psalm. I waited patiently for the Lord, and He turned to me and heard my cry for help. He brought me up from the desolate pit out of the muddy clay, set my feet on a rock, making my steps secure. He put His new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. How happy is the man who puts his trust in the Lord and he has not turned to the proud or to those who run after lies. Lord, my God, you have done many things. Your wonderful works and your plans for me, none can compare with you. If I were to report and speak to them, they were more than can be told. You do not delight in sacrifice and offering. You open my ears to listen. You do not ask for a whole burnt offering or a sin offering. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious fathers, the psalmist says that you dug out his ears to listen. Lord, there are many things in our own ears this morning. Many things that often distract us from hearing you, from hearing your word. Lord, may this be a time that you dig out our ears to hear from you. In your name I pray, amen. Uh, Like many... Here today, uh, you are a consumer. Uh, In our household, I might be a consumer. Jolene does most of the grocery shopping. But sometimes I take note uh, when an item or something is actually smaller than what it used to be. And many times if you're out and about at the grocery store or shopping, you know, here and there you might find an item that's actually less than what it used to be and you're actually paying the same or even more than what you were in the past. And examples of some of this might be a bottle of Gatorade. You know, uh, bottles are now only 28 ounces instead of uh, 32 ounces, what they were years ago. And the marketers tell you that, well, athletes prefer a smaller bottle nowadays. <laughs> I'm sure they do. <laughs> it's summertime, and a few of us might like to eat a little more ice cream this time of year. I've got to be careful in saying that so the kids don't hear <laughs> And come running. But I noticed that Klondike bars are also significantly smaller than they used to be. You know, pretty soon they're going to be like peppermint patties, right? (laughs) Please tell me those haven't changed. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Uh, Natural Valley came out with a a sweet and salty bar years ago, kind of like a granola bar. And I had one uh, just recently. I was stunned that it's significantly smaller than it used to be when they first came out. Don't even get me started on double-stuffed Oreos, okay? <laughs> this is called shrinkflation. It's an economic term also known as the grocery shrink or uh, deflation or packaging downsizing. Uh, Wikipedia says it's a process of an item shrinking in size or uh, quantity, uh, even sometimes reformulating or reducing quality while their prices remain the same or increase. And it goes on to say that they are reducing the product value by stealth. The uh, reduction in pack size is significantly small as not to be immediately obvious for regular customers. An article by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics in a column called Beyond the Numbers, this is volume 12, published in uh, February this year, was written by Kerry McNair, uh, explains how uh, what is called CPI, which is uh, Consumer Price Index, measures this shrinkflation. And I won't bore you with the rest of it with all the statistics, but I thought 
The first two paragraphs are intriguing when Kerry writes this. You may have noticed recently, and I'm quoting from this article, you may have uh, noticed recently that you're going through a roll of paper towels at a faster clip, or there uh, seems to be fewer tortilla chips in the bag. This isn't your imagination. The concept is known as downsizing or shrinkflation. We'll use the term downsizing in this article. And input, as input costs increase and the cost to create a uh, product rises, companies can increase the list of goods or they can offer a smaller amount of that product for the same price. So a candy bar's size might change from 1.6 ounces to 1.5 ounces. Yet the price stays the same. In other words, the price per unit the customer pays increases as the amount they purchase decreases, while the price they pay at the register remains the same. It goes on in the article to say, downsizing is common across the food and household commodities, including potato chips, paper towels, cereal, cleaning supplies, and candy. Manufacturers change sizes because market research indicates that consumers are more sensitive to price change than size change. Downsizing impacts the amount of a good, amount of a good a customer receives. Therefore, goods that are sold at a specific unit weight or volume do not experience downsizing. For example, gasoline or steaks generally do not experience downsizing as they are sold per gallon or per pound. End of quote. Now, Kerry goes on to describe how manufacturers go about actually changing the size or quantity of an item while not changing the price or only increasing the price slightly while downsizing the product themselves. And they do this in many different ways. Uh, as you might get a roll of toilet paper or paper towels and they have less in the roll or by adding air to a bag of chips. Uh, they put a bigger uh, dimple in the bottom of that jar, uh, change the packaging, the carton size, or even the product themselves. So in conclusion, uh, Kerry states that this shrinkflation or downsizing really has little effect over the overall picture of inflation and the downsizing that's seen in the grocery stores. On a number of products, uh, they say, is only 0.1%. Uh, in comparison to the commodity and service rendered level on a big scale. Now all this is to say is that you seem like you're getting less, but actually paying more. So what does shrinkflation and downsizing have to do with Psalm 40, you ask? Well, absolutely nothing. <laughs> I just thought it was something interesting to talk about and to think about as we start this psalm. So Psalm 40 verse 1, for the choir director, a Davidic psalm, he says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me and heard my cry for help. Now, the psalm can be classified in a number of ways, whether it's a song or thanksgiving, a lament, a testimony. Uh, but kind of, you know, put classification aside, there is a, a song of thanksgiving and deliverance. There are parallels to the psalm, as in Psalm 27 and Psalm 70, uh, which one commentator might put, this in the realm of a royal liturgy uh, of supplication, a liturgy of supplication. And this can be in the sense of a kingly prayer that's recorded. The psalm continues very, uh, the psalm contextually could very well fit into the life of King David when he's seeking deliverance from King Saul and others. There's also a tie to 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23, which will look to in a few minutes. At the very first start of the psalm, we, we do not see a plea like we saw last week in Psalm 15, uh, or even a direct call to action. But instead, the psalmist is retelling a work that God has done in his life. And he starts out by saying, as you can see, I waited patiently for the Lord. How many of us can make this same claim today? We waited patiently on the Lord. You know, maybe as uh, children might do this when they're writing a letter to Santa. You know, they might, you know, might start out by saying, you know, yes, indeed, I was patient this year. I mean, I was very patient this year. I mean, I was superbly patient this year. Just don't ask my parents. <laughs> no, seriously, the psalmist has been patient. was waiting for God to answer him. He says, and it goes on to say that the Lord turned to him. Some versions say he inclined to him. In other words, God listened. 
Not only did he listen to his cry for help, but notice how he responds to his cry in verses 2 and 3. It says, He brought me up from a desolate place out of the muddy clay, set my feet on a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. As we come across this word pit, here's a few different meanings to this word. The basic meaning is just the, that of a well or a cistern that someone dug to get water. You know, hand-dug wells uh, were common in the biblical days. And later we find that these wells or pits were sometimes used as a holding tank or a prison for someone. You might recall the term pit uh, used in the story of Joseph after the coat of many colors incident. We read Genesis thirty-three twenty-seven. Reuben said to them, don't shed blood. Throw him, Joseph, into the pit in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him, intending to rescue him from their hands and return him to their father. So this pit can be the idea of a, a, a dungeon, a, a holding tank, a prison. And not only do we see this as a holding cell, but uh, again, in light of a place for prisoners, we see the uh, uh, prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 38.6. It says, they took Jeremiah and dropped him in the cistern of Malachi, the king's son, uh, who was the guard's courtyard, lowering Jeremiah with ropes. There was no water in the cistern, only mud. And Jeremiah sank into the mud. With seemingly a parallel context to perhaps what David finds himself metaphorically in, a deep pit in thick mud. If you ever, ever tried to try to work through some deep mud or clay, you know this significantly slows down your work, your efforts, your machines. Perhaps you lost a boot or two trying to just get out. It has a way of getting a hold on you, that thick clay or mud. But not even this mud or this clay could hold down the psalmist when God delivers him out of the thick mud, out of the deep pit. But where does he place him? It says on a rock. One commentator noted that this is not just any rock or a, a, a piece of flagstone on some, some sand, but the imagery is of a large chiseled mountain cliff that no one could actually safely climb. And it's God who puts his feet on this mountain cliff, this rock. Now, why so specific? Because it describes the fact that God has set him in a place that no pit or no one could reach him. High above and secure from the trap that he was in. Now, some of us might be in a similar pit this morning. The weight of life seems to be more than you can endure, more than you can carry on your own, more than you can handle. Is there hope? Is there an answer here? Perhaps. Look with me at verse 3. It says, out of this deliverance, he says, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Most interesting, who's the one instigating this psalm, this hymn? It's the Lord. God put a hymn of praise in his mouth in addition to delivering him. But it's not just personal, it's also contagious. It's seen by others. They see, they fear, and they put their trust in the Lord. God's divine intervention is impacting not just the psalmist, but those around him for God's glory. One commentator called this as a, a hymn of victory, a song of victory for what God has done in their life. There's a change in the object of verse, in verses 4 and 5, a shift in focus. Look with me. Verses 4 and 5, How happy is the man who has put his trust in the Lord and has not turned to the proud or those who run after lies. Lord, my God, you have done many things, your wonderful works and your plans for me. None can compare with you. If I were to report and to speak of them, they are more than can be told. Notice he declares how happy or blessed is the man who puts his trust in the Lord. 
The word for a man here has a sense of a young, strong man. Perhaps someone who is used to doing things by themselves, by their own strength, by their own will. But he is not blessed. The one who is blessed is the one who puts his trust not in himself or in his abilities, but instead the one who is happy and blessed is the one who puts his trust in the Lord. Does not turn to the proud or those who run after lies. Notice the three descriptions of the one who is blessed or happy. They put their trust in the Lord, have not turned to the proud, and last, they have not run after those who chase after lies. Verse 5 then is a proclamation of all that God has done. Lord, my God, you have done many things. Your wonderful works and your plans for us, no one can compare with you. Notice when we put our trust in the Lord that no one can compare to him. There's a restatement in this at the end of the verse when he says, if I were to report and speak of them, they are more than can be told. This might sound similar to John 21, 25, which might be an echo of this verse in the New Testament. When John is talking about the works of Jesus and he says, as you may know, there are many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose not even the world itself could contain the books that would be written. You know, we often have a limited view of the Bible at times. In the sense that uh, that only the works of God that he ever that God has ever done are only recorded here in the Bible. No. These are not all the works or miracles or divine interventions of God, but they are enough for us to know his character, the nature of God, his divine plan of redemption, to help us engage him and know the value of eternity that is promised to those who believe. No such library can contain all the works that God has done. The focus here, though, is on the comparative nature in the sense that no one or no other source can compare to the wonderful works that God has done. You know, you may have a rich neighbor. This person's a self-made man or woman. They have worked hard, and then they brag about their accomplishments. They say, look at my big house. Uh Uh-huh, okay. They say, look at my ten cars. Look at my great business. Uh Uh-huh, okay. Look at my uh, big bank account, the schools I can send my kids to, my yacht. Uh Uh-huh. Is that it? Well, yeah, well, that's about it. In a sense, though, whether you or your neighbor doesn't have a, a second house or a yacht, a vacation home, if we're honest, we might say, well, just like my neighbor, put their own deeds, their own accomplishments over what God has done, over these wonderful works that God has done. We say, look at me. Look at what I've accomplished. And really, when we do so, we give God the ribbon of second place in our life. Instead of proclaiming His wonderful deeds, we recall one really good deed done by God who has helped us and seemingly forget about the rest. Verbally, we might declare, God is one. But our lives preach a different sermon to those around us. Our last verse is very straightforward about this thought. Look at verse 6. You do not delight in sacrifice and offering. You open my ears to listen. You do not ask for a whole burnt offering or a sin offering. If we were to take verse 6 and just read it by itself with no context, you might think that the psalmist is condemning sacrifice and offering, which you would then ask, you know, why did God require sacrifice and offering in the first place? If he didn't require it, we could just take a pair of scissors to Leviticus and just take it out of the Bible. Take out all the rules about sacrifice and offerings if God is not pleased with them, if He does not require them, as it seems like the psalmist is saying. 
Well, for starters, let's look at a, a perhaps an intentional correlation here. When Samuel confronts Saul, as I mentioned earlier, 1 Samuel 15, 22 through 23, it reads this. Then Samuel said, Does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offering and sacrifice as much as in obeying the Lord? Look, to obey is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. For, your, uh, for rebellion is like the sin of divination, and defiance is like wickedness and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. These are some pretty strong words of the uh, prophet Samuel to Saul, even telling him that he has been rejected as king. You see, God is concerned about the heart behind the sacrifice. Think about the words of Jesus in Matthew 22. When Jesus is asked, what is the uh, greatest and most important commandment? We know he says, uh, for, he, he says first, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then he says, second, as we know, love your neighbor as yourself. These are very potent commands that Jesus gives. But imagine if they were reversed. And instead, we sought to love our neighbor with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. If we gave all our love to our neighbor, what then would be left for God? That's why I keep this in order the way Jesus gave it to us. We give all our love with all our mind, all our heart, all our soul to God. You say, wait, if we give all our heart, soul, and, and mind to the Lord, what's left for our neighbor? What if it's not our love? But now it's God's love working through us. There's no point in sacrifice if our heart is not in the right place. There's reason to believe here that in this royal liturgy of supplication, as a com one commentator describes, that the sacrifice and offering would be a part of this supplication and request. Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 19 is a description of the importance of how a leader is to lead in his relationship with God when it says, when he is seated on his royal throne, he is to write a copy of this instruction for himself on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priest. Notice verse 19 of Deuteronomy 17. It is to remain with him, and he is to read it for all the days of his life, so that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to observe all the words of this instruction, and to do these statutes. So David is not seeking to eliminate sacrifice and offering altogether, but instead it's that God's primary desire is that our heart and dependence is completely on him. But that being said, if we think about this, it, uh, the begging part of this psalm is God's deliverance and what God has done for the psalmist. And in contrast, infinitely more than either he or anyone could have done for himself. This reminds us that with God, less is more. With God, less is more. With God and our dependence on Him, less is really more. When we depend fully on Him, less of our own strength means more of God's power. If you were to rely upon God's help in your life as a believer, less self-centered behavior, less egocentric mentality really means more reliance and patience towards God. With God, less is more. Remember the psalmist found himself in need of divine intervention. 
a task that only God could deliver him from, out of the pit, imprisoned in a deep, dark dungeon, deep in the muddy clay. Instead of saying, you know, I can do this myself, I can rescue myself. No, he waited patiently on God. Instead, he was more reliant upon God in his patience. God turned to him and rescued him. Not only did he rescue him, but he put his feet in a place far insecure from the grips of evildoers. There is a sense here that the life of a believer is less about duty and more about desire. Not only can we see that in verse 6, but also in verse 3 where it says, He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. You know, sometimes you know we come to church with a despondent heart. And we're like, well, I'm here, but I'd rather be in bed. I'd rather be at the lake or on the beach. In that moment, we don't feel like praising God in that moment. But sometimes through worship, we experience what when we think of uh, actually thinking less of ourselves, we end up thinking more on who God is, His blessings on us. Our attitudes might actually change. We become more dependent on Him and His strength. With God, less means more. Less anxiety means more patience. Less empty rituals means more meaningful praise and obedience. Verse 4, less anger means more blessing and happiness. And then along with less idols. Less pride, self-centered people means there's more room for confidence in what God has done in our life, in the history, in the world. Less complaining gives more room to proclaiming of what God has done. Verse 5 says, if we are to report and speak of them, they are more than can be told. More. More than can be told. You say, I can't take on more in my life right now. There's only so much time in the day. Perhaps you can do less. In doing so, give God more. Our children sometimes display this principle whether we realize it or not. Less means more. Their thinking is, well, if I have less dinner, then I have more room for dessert. If I take less naps, then I have more time to play. If I share less with my friends, then I have more to myself. And as a parent, sometimes we have to instill upon them the opposite of what they think is right for them and really what is most important or what is best for them. You see, God has more to give each and every one of us when there's less of our own wants standing in the way. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, the psalmist desires more of you in his life. He is patiently waiting sharing his thanksgiving. We'll see in the coming weeks his supplication, his desire for you to continue to work in his life, continue to respond, continue to act. Lord, but as we can see and examine the psalmist sees people who have walked away have put stock in their own pride, followed after other idols. And yet, Lord, he is content in declaring who you are, your wonderful deeds. And you have put a new song in his mouth, a song of praise. Gracious Lord, in the world in which we live, there are constant voices, 
constant trends, constant social norms that we need more, 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 more. The Lord as a psalmist seems to relate that when we're doing less of the things that seek to build us up, our own agenda, our own self-centeredness, egocentric, when we seek to do less of these things, we're allowing more of you, more of your will, more of your power, more of your divine intervention to be at work in our lives. Lord, we might want more, but sometimes it takes doing less. May we praise you for what you've done. It's your name that I pray. Amen. Just be reminded this morning of a few announcements that didn't get noticed uh, uh, this morning as we started, such as the corn roast, which is in on August 20th, and their leadership night. Uh, all leaders, we hope that you can attend. Uh, closing, I just want to read uh, number 6, 22 through 26, where it says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Lord bless you. We'll see you next week.